Okay, so we're coming off of a video where we learned how to simplify radicals for the first time. You know, we saw a little bit of it. The, the thing with what we saw in the previous lesson is that the radicals all simplified down perfectly. In other words, the radical was gone, there was nothing that was left underneath the radical sign, and the stuff that we're going to be starting with today is a little bit different. We're going to be simplifying down radicals, but um, to a point where they will still have things left underneath the radical sign, and you'll see what I mean when we look at some examples. And we're also going to be looking at operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of radicals. Okay, so you'll see there's similarities to some of the other stuff we've done with operations. So first topic, simplifying radicals. We've got this thing called the product property, and it starts off by saying for any real numbers a and b and any integer n that's greater than 1, if you're doing something like this, if you're taking the nth root, remember n is the index, and you've got a product underneath the radicand. You know, a times b, maybe it's, maybe it's 2 times x, or maybe it's 12 times c squared times d, or c to the 6, d to the 3rd, whatever it is. This tells you that you can split them up. All right, you can split them up like this, take the nth root of them separately, and multiply them together. And we've, we've essentially seen things like this when we've simplified radicals before, but just to kind of get it in writing that we've got an official theorem. In order for a radical to be in simplest form, because that's what we're going to be working on, is getting these things down to what we call simplest form. Um, the radicand cannot, remember the radicand is the stuff underneath the radical sign. The radicand cannot contain any nth powers of integers or polynomials. Okay, in order to be in simplest form, the radicand cannot contain any nth powers of integers or polynomials. So let's stick with like a simple square root, just to give you an example. Say we're taking the square root of something. In order to be simplified, you can't have any perfect squares left underneath the radical sign, which is why like the square root of 8, for instance, isn't simplified, because there's a 4 within the, uh, with the factors of 8. So I'll show you an example with this one. We're going to simplify this one down. Um, so for part A, we're taking a square root. The entire idea of taking a square root is finding something that multiplies by itself two times in order to get a number. So, you know, like the square root of 36 is 6, because 6 times 6 gives you 36. Now, 12 is not a perfect square, but we can break it down. So, since we're looking for things that multiply by themselves twice, we're looking for groups of two things, things that kind of come as a pair, if you will. So we are going to break this thing down. So square root of, now 12, like I said, is not a perfect square, but we can write it as 4 times 3, and 4 is a perfect square. So I'm going to write 4 as 2 times 2, comes as a pair, and then times 3. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down all of the c's and all of the d's, and I'll kind of explain why. So c to the 6th means we've got 6 copies of c, and then d to the 3rd means, of course, 3 copies of d. So since we're taking a square root and trying to simplify it down, we're looking for pairs of things. So 2 and 2 come as a pair. 3 doesn't have a buddy, so there's nothing we can do with it for right now. Here's a pair of C's, another pair of C's, and one more. And then we've got one pair of D's and then one left out. Okay, so when we're simplifying, we're going to take the square root of each of these pieces individually. So the square root of 2 times 2 is 2, so we can bring that out. Square root of C times C is C square root of c times c is c, and then we've got one more. So there are three pairs that I've circled here. So that means I can bring a c cubed, three pairs of c's out from underneath the radical sign. And then one pair of d's, so I can bring that out. Then what you do is you write the leftovers underneath your radical sign. So there's a 3 that didn't have a partner and a d that didn't have a partner, and so I can't simplify them and bring them out at all. So that's your final answer. You bring out whatever you can, whatever is a perfect square, and then anything that isn't part of a perfect square, you have to leave it underneath the radical sign. Okay, let's do another one on the next page with third powers. Oops, next page. So with third powers, instead of looking for groups of 2 this time, we're looking for groups of 3. All right, so 27 actually is already a perfect cube, so cube root of, we're going to write 3 times 3 times 3. So again, we're looking for 
groups of three to know that it would be a perfect cube rather than a perfect square this time. And then we're gonna do the same thing we did with the Y's and the Z's. We're gonna write every single one of them out. So 12 of them. Twelve and seven Z's. Five, six, seven. Okay. So I'll put that all underneath the radical sign. Now we are looking for groups of three. So right here we've got a group of three, and it just matches whatever the index is. On a square root, the index is technically two. So we're just circling these groups of three, so we can figure out how many of group, how many groups of three there are, so we know what we can bring out from underneath the cube root. There's our leftover there. So we can bring out a three, because we've got a trio of threes there. We have one, two, three, four groups of y. So we can bring out y to the fourth. And then we have two groups of z's. So we can bring out a z squared. The only thing left underneath the cube root is just a single z. It's the only thing that didn't come in a group of three that had to be left under there. Okay, so that's simplified form for that one. All right, another similar thing that we can look at is something called the quotient property. Very similar to the product properties, except, of course, with a quotient rather than a product. So this one tells us we can take the nth root of the numerator and then divide it by the nth root of the denominator. So kind of splitting it up just like we can do with the product rule. Okay, so we've got this thing called rationalizing the denominator. Another one of our rules that we're going to talk about, two rules actually. We've got one rule that says we can't have radicals in the denominator, so we have to fix this. We've got another rule that says we can't have any fractions underneath the square root. And these are all things we're going to write, write down below. But first, for rationalizing the denominator. Rationalizing the denominator literally means making the denominator rational. Um, something under a square root or a cube root is not rational, it's irrational. So we've got this process that helps us to make the denominator rational. So the way this process works is by multiplying the numerator and denominator. by a quantity by a quantity, and that sounds very vague, but I'll explain to you what that quantity needs to be, so that the radicand, remember again, that's the stuff underneath the square root, has an exact root. Okay, so the reason that all I can say is a quantity is because it's going to change every time. It depends on what the index is. It depends on what's already in the radicand, so I can't give you a perfect definition for that, but I will explain it as we're walking through these next two examples. So example two, part A and B. One of our rules that we're going to write down at the bottom of the page is that we can't have a square root in the denominator, or a cube root, or a fourth root, or whatever. So we have to make sure this is going to be a perfect root. Now right now, b to the fifth is not a perfect square. Um, the only way to make these perfect squares is if they're an even number, because then I can circle groups of two. So if I had just one more copy of b, it would end up being a perfect square. Okay, so that's what you do. The thing that I'm missing is another copy of b, because then I'd have six total copies, and then it would be an exact root. But I can't multiply the denominator without multiplying the numerator, so I do that. Multiply the numerator together, so under the square root I will have a to the ninth times b, and then over under this square root I will have a b to the sixth. Alright, so now I'm going to simplify this down, so I'm going to do the same thing I did in the front. Square root of, I've got nine copies of a, one copy of b, and then in the denominator I have six copies of b. Okay? That's the reason I chose to multiply in just one more copy of b, because as soon as I have 6, I can pair them off, and that's what makes it a perfect square. Then I pair these off, so my index is 2, which means I'm looking for pairs. So here I can bring out, I've got 4 pairs of a, so I can bring out an a to the 4th. I have an a, b that's left underneath the square root, because none of those are perfect squares. And then in the denominator, I can simplify that to a b cubed. Okay, so this thing right here is exactly equal to this thing right here. I just had to do this because I'm not allowed to have square roots in the denominator. So I just rationalized my denominator, a.k.a. got rid of the radical. Okay, let's do this again here. 
So what I have so far is I have 2 times 2 times y, if we look at that denominator, and I want them to be perfect fifths. So I'm going to start, first of all, with my quotient property, and I'm going to split this to the fifth root of 3 over the fifth root of 4y. And then I can kind of look at the denominator just as a separate entity. So times, now I need to figure out what exactly I'm going to multiply in. And it has to be a fifth root because this is a fifth root. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to multiply them. So I already have two copies of two. Now, in order for it to be a perfect root, I need five copies of everything. So two times two, I need three more copies of two, which is eight. And then here I only have one copy of y, so I need four more copies of y in order to have an exact root. Okay, and now remember the rule. I do the exact same thing to the numerator and denominator. That way I'm just multiplying by a fancy one. So this equals the fifth root of, I'm going to multiply my numerator out, I get 24 from the 3 times 8, y to the fourth, over the fifth root of 32, y to the fifth. Okay, simplify this up one more time. The numerator actually can't be simplified at all. There are no perfect fifth roots in 24. And y to the fourth is just one power too few. Over, now the fifth root of 32 is 2. And the fifth root of y to the fifth is y. So I've just rationalized that denominator. Again, in other words, I got rid of the radical sign in the denominator. Okay, so some of these rules that I just followed here, I'm going to sim or, uh, you know, kind of write down a really quick list of rules that you should be following. If I tell you to simplify radical expressions, all four of these rules need to be good. So first thing is that n must be as small as possible. And that's the index. So if there's any way to simplify up the index, then you need to do that. It needs to be as small as possible. Um, the radicand has no nth powers. So if you're taking a square root, you can't have any perfect squares left under the radical. If you're taking a cube root, you can't have any perfect cubes left under the radical. Um, the radicand has no fractions. You're not allowed to have fractions if you're in simplified form. That's one of the first reasons we had to fix example 2 part b, because we had a fraction underneath the radical sign. That means you're not in simplified form yet. And then last thing, no radicals in the denominator. So that's what we just worked on fixing. Okay, so we'll use those four rules. We'll kind of be able to flash back to them to make sure that when we're simplifying things down, we're following all of those rules and making sure that they are, in fact, in simplified form. Okay, on to the last page, we are going to talk about our operations. So multiplication, addition, subtraction, division. So starting with these, we're going to start with multiplication. Okay, so just taking one radical term and multiplying it by another radical term. One thing I'd like to point out is that you're not allowed to multiply them together unless they have the same index. So in part A, they're both square roots. In part B, they're both fourth roots. That's the only reason you're allowed to multiply them together. So if you start with this one, you multiply the numbers on the outside. So 6 times 4, and we have a 24 on the outside. Square root of, now let's multiply all this stuff together. So 8 times 2 gives me 16. c to the third times c, I add up those powers and I get c to the fourth. d to the fifth times d cubed, again add those powers and I get d to the eighth. Okay, so this one, these are actually all perfect squares. So let me show you. So 24, the square root of 16 is 4. It's one that we should know by now. Square root of c to the fourth. All right, remember that little trick that I showed you guys in the last notes? This index is 4. I'm sorry, this power is 4, the index is 2. So I just divide 4 by 2. I get c squared. Here the power is 8, the index is still 2. So I divide 8 by 2. And I get a d to the 4th. If I were to square this thing again, I would end up right back here. So you can just do that as a little check for yourself if you'd like. Last thing to simplify is we're going to multiply the 24 times 4. Once we get that all simplified up, that is your final answer. Okay, another one with part B, but with fourth roots this time. So same thing, multiply the numbers on the outside. 2 times 3 gives me 6. And then fourth root of 8 times 2 
again, 16, x to the third times x to the fifth. Okay, add those powers, I get x to the eighth. y squared times y squared, add those powers, we get y to the fourth. So these are actually all perfect fourths as well. So I have a six on the outside. The fourth root of 16, aka what multiplies by itself four times and gives me 16, that would be two. There's a couple of these that you should start to have memorized by now. What multiplies by itself four times to give me x to the eighth? Well, I just divide eight by four. It's an x squared. So if you picture x squared times x squared times x squared times x squared, that does give you x to the eighth. And then the fourth root of y to the fourth, of course, leaves me just with y. So multiply those numbers together, the two times six, and that's your final answer for that one. Okay, so that's one set of operations that we have. We can multiply entire radicals together. Okay, now for adding and subtracting, we need to know about something called like radical expressions, which is very similar to like terms. You can only combine like radical expressions just like you can only combine like terms. So they're like radical expressions if both the index and the radicand are identical. Okay, so same index and same radicand. You can't, you know, like the square root of 3 compared to the cube root of 3 aren't like roots um, or like radicals. The square root of 6 and the square root of 7, not like radicals. You know, only like the square root of 8 and the square root of 8 are exactly the same. So here, as far as we can tell, none of them are the same. But if you look, root 12, root 27, root 128, those are not simplified down yet. So we're going to take a moment and do that first. 5, and then for 12, we can break 12 down to 4 and 3. We'll simplify that in a moment. Plus 2, and then 27. We can break that down into 9 and 3, because we know 9 is a perfect square. Minus, and then for the square root of 128, 128 is actually 64 times 2. And we know 64 is a perfect square. All right, so when I take the square root of 4, I get 2. And I already had a 5 out front, so 2 times 5 is 10. And then I have a 3 left underneath the radical sign. Plus, next one, 9 is my perfect square. The square root of 9 is 3. Times the 2 that was already there gives me 6. And then I have a 3 left underneath the radical. Minus, square root of 64 is 8, so I bring the 8 out front. And then I have a 2 left under the square root. Okay, so that simplifying step is huge. The next step tells me that I can combine up any like radical expressions if I have any. And these two, these are like radical expressions because their radical part is exactly the same. Same index, same number. So I have 10 of them here and I have 6 of them here, which means I have 16 times the square root of 3. Okay, and then minus 8 root 2. And that is actually as far as we can take that one. Okay, so that's addition. We kind of have addition and subtraction combined up in the same problem here. The big thing to remember here is just like polynomials, you can't add anything that doesn't have the exact same radical part very similar to a variable part. Okay, example four, kind of another multiplication example. We're gonna be foiling this time. Okay, so a binomial times a binomial, we're gonna foil. So I'll multiply these two together. I multiply the six times two and I get 12. Then multiply root three times root five. Three times five gives me a 15 under the square root. Outside, I multiply these two together. Six times four is 24. And then root 3 times root 2 is root 6. Inside, negative 5 times 2 is negative 10. And then I've got a root 5. Then last, times these two together. Negative 5 times 4 is negative 20. And then I have a root 2 underneath the radical. Okay, now 15, there's nothing I can do to simplify there. Same with 6, same with 5, same with 2. So there's no simplifying that can be done. And none of the radical parts are the same. So this is actually going to be your final answer. We've simplified that down as much as we can. Okay, so our last thing to do is kind of like division. And we're going to remind you of something called conjugates. Conjugates are binomials that are opposites in the middle. Okay, so let's say binomials of the form a root b plus c root d and a root b minus c root d. 
So the only difference between a binomial and its conjugate is the sign in the middle. And we've talked about those before. The big important thing, the reason why we use conjugates at all, is because the product is always rational, and we need things to be rational. Okay, so last example here. We've got a square with side A. The ratio of a side to the difference between a diagonal and its side is this formula right here. Don't worry too much about this crazy formula or what it means. The important part is that we're going to rationalize this denominator. Okay, So start with a and then over a root 2 minus a. So this isn't really division, but kind of. It's like you're trying to divide these two things together. We're going to rationalize the denominator because one of our rules is that that root 2 can't be there. So the conjugate is the same as this but with the opposite sign. So I'm going to multiply the denominator by a root 2 plus a. And of course, remember, whatever you multiply into the denominator, you have to multiply into the numerator. So we're going to FOIL those out. All right, in the numerator, I'm just going to distribute. So a times a gives me a squared, and then times root 2. Then these two, a times a is just an a squared, over these two. So a times a is a squared. And then root 2 times root 2 is 2. So I'm actually going to put that 2 out front. Outside, a times a is a squared root 2. Inside right here is minus a squared root 2. And then finally, negative a times a is a negative a squared. Okay, so let's look at the simplifying that happens here. First of all, those middle terms cancel out because I have one positive, one negative. So you'll notice my square roots are gone from the denominator, which is good. Okay, the numerator, I'm going to write this exactly the way it is. In the denominator, I have a 2a squared minus an a squared, leaving me just with an a squared. Finally, last thing I can do is I can divide out, cancel an a squared from everything. So here, I'm just left with a root 2. And then here, when I cancel out the a squareds, I'm technically left with the 1. Don't forget about that 1. So that is your final answer. Okay, so the conjugates are used to kind of do this division sort of thing. All right, so we've done some operations. The next thing we've got coming up is something called rational exponents, which are a lot of radical work. Again, similar stuff.